Good morning. All right, this is Revolution Church, and I'm Richard Myers. Uh, we're glad that you're checking us out this week. Uh, we had a lot of new faces come around over the last several weeks, and, and some people just fall in love with our vision of our church, right? And they just like it that it's raw, that we try to make uh, God's Word easy to understand, and it's easy to plug in, and sometimes people, they just want it to be easy, all right, in, in a good kind of way. So we're starting a brand new series called That Moment, because everything, it's possible for anything and everything to change in a flash, in a blink of an eye, for that maybe for the good or not so good, right? And so what we're doing, we're just trying to be disciples of Jesus. We're, that's our whole job here is to move people from where they are to where God wants them to be. And so we're going to have fun during this series. I think this is going to be the most fun one we've had this year as it moves along. And so I want to kind of make sure you're capturing the idea of what we're trying to get across with this series, right? That, that moment. When we talk about that moment, all right? So we picked out some pictures, or somebody did, to kind of illustrate what that moment can kind of look like. So put it up there, Josh. What's the first one? Okay, check this lady out. She, she looks like she has no idea that she's about to fall in that pool. All right? Her life is about to change in that moment, not for the good. And so uh, she probably didn't wake up that, that morning feeling like, man, something's going to go wrong today. Something's going to not go the way I expected it. Let's move on, Josh. And that dude's just chilling. Okay, watch out. Now, I don't know what he's drinking there. I can't, I can't be honest with what it might be. But what it, whether, whatever it is, he's about to fall flat. He's like about to hit his elbows and the back of his head. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? That's always embarrassing. Somebody's not just watching or taking a picture of it, right? And so that, this is one of those times where it's that moment, right? Just kind of unexpected and without really preparation that something happens to you. All right, let's do it again, Josh. Okay, watch out. Now, does this lady, maybe she's blind, I'm not sure. But she's about to get swallowed up. And it's definitely about to change for her. And she probably didn't predict this. But her life is about to change in that moment. Let's do it again. Okay, this looks like a sweet 16. It doesn't look so sweet here, does it? This lady's going to drop. I'm sure she didn't get the cake and decorate it and have that good-looking fella. Looks like he's pushing her. I don't know. I don't know how much he's helping but not so sweet. Oh, and look at this. I probably did this. I used to would do that before I, before I got saved. Okay, you get hit in the face with something. Hey, look, he's still got the look on his face like it, happened, it hadn't happened yet, but I'm at that moment. Let's do it again, Josh. One more. Is this the last one? Okay, look. What awesome friends you have. When you got a bun and sleeveless and I don't know. They're acting like they don't even know him in that moment, right? So his, and check this out. There's a good buddy, too. He had no idea. This is probably a special moment. He didn't know it was going to go bad in that moment, but there it did. Is there any more Josh? That did. That's plenty. Oh, yeah. Okay, this is, this is that moment. Right before she vows and commits to never get on a swing again, she's doing a face plan, and she probably didn't plan on this. It just happened, and this can't turn out good. I can't see how that, unless she's some kind of ninja... Right? Is that it, Josh? Okay, this has got to be the last one. Uh, I don't know what they were trying to accomplish, but she wished it wouldn't have happened. So she's just discovered, she's in the middle of that moment. She's seeing the look on her face shows that I know that moment. So that's where we are today. Give those a hand clap. Thanks for <laughs> illustrating that for us. You know, there's something about that moment. It, it, it's just unexpected. A lot of times, we, we're the kind of people that like to plan. We plan this. We plan weddings. We plan all kind of stuff. We plan our days. We have calendars. We like to make it where we're not really not expecting something. That's why we plan. That's why we try to maneuver in our uh, situations and, and man even manipulate our circumstances so that we can not be taken by surprise, right? Because we want to avoid that moment because a lot of times that moment is not a good moment, right? And so we try to do that, but we're going to see in Scripture today, we're going to look at Jesus. Uh, it's an important time of year and in, in the life of our church to look at Jesus and some of his encounters that he had and that where he, he was the king, literally the king of that moment. People that would encounter him uh, would be desperate maybe. They, maybe they've been working their whole life trying to work on their circumstances, fix themselves. They just couldn't find the answer. But they thought, man, if I can just get in Jesus' presence, maybe I can have that moment in the good kind of way. 
that Jesus would come in and, and intercept that. So we're gonna, I'm going to take you through uh, 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 the, the book of Luke. And Luke is awesome. I'll tell you a little bit more about him in a minute. But it's, it's, it's worded very well. So if you're, if you're just getting started with the Bible or trying to rediscover it or you're trying to understand it, maybe God's putting something in you to start reading your Bible or start to read it more, Luke's a good place to be. He writes from an angle that, that is very um, easy, easier to comprehend. So I'm gonna, we're going to look at Luke chapter 8 this morning if you've got a Bible or if you don't. If you've got a smart pad, a smart phone, or we've got smart screens. And uh, I want you to follow along just so to help you make sure I'm not making this stuff up because this is pretty awesome stuff, pretty unbelievable stuff. So uh, it's one of my favorite. You're going to see why it's one of my favorite. Maybe it's going to be one of yours favorite accounts in all of Scripture. It's just an awesome wording. It's supposed to draw us into Jesus like we never had been before. And, God, and, and what Jesus is trying to do is to see him more clearly. Okay? And so we're going to look at, and some of you need that moment. You need for God something that you need him to act on. And we're going to kind of, through this series and a little bit today, look at how that happens. I need God to come through for me. I need that moment. So in Luke chapter 8, verse 40, we're going to start there. Feel free to look at the screen. It says, now when Jesus returned, Jesus, and that means Jesus was somewhere else. Jesus went off for ministry throughout the region. And so it's saying Jesus, he would come back to his hub, and then he would go back out. And so he would return to cities. All right? And sto stories about what he, had, what he had done, about his teaching and his healing, would... would would go ahead of him. And it's saying that Jesus returned and a crowd welcomed him, just like you are today. You decided that I'm not just going to be an individual. I'm going to create a crowd for Jesus because Jesus loved a crowd. He, that's what he wanted. That's, that's who he spoke to, right? And so you decided this morning, I hope you had this, this thought, is not just for me, but I'm going to be a part of creating a crowd for Jesus. I want our church to be that, to have that mentality, right? Is I want Jesus to have the biggest crowd possible. And it says a crowd welcomed him. That means they were looking forward to what he had to say. They were looking in expectation. And maybe that's the, the, the frame of mind that you are in. Or maybe you'll pray about and, and be in when you, when you think about Sundays and you think about church and you think about gathering. That it's with expectation. You're welcoming Jesus. That you want to see what he might do for you. It says, and they, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus. That's a pretty cool name. My name, my next kid, that. Jairus, a synagogue leader, he's a pretty big deal, came and fell at the feet of Jesus. So when Jesus came, we see, we don't see any hesitation. We see this guy named Jairus with the cool name uh, come, and he, he just fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house. He's, he's pretty desperate, right? He's putting his reputation on the line. He's very desperate because his only daughter, not one of his daughters, his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. Something was wrong with her. This needed urgent and immediate attention. And he wasn't going to waste any time, and maybe you feel the same way. I need to get in front of Jesus because there's an urgency about my life and my situation. And so this Jairus did that. As Jesus was on his way, listen, Jesus didn't hesitate. He says, he's saying, okay, man, let's go. I hear what you're saying. I want to get involved. Let's go. And so Jesus had said that Jesus was on his way, but the crowds almost crushed him. So many people needed Jesus in their situation. And some people were curious. Some people were crowding in place just out of curiosity, right? And so it says that it almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no, no one could heal her. So he's on his way to this very big deal. It's a very important situation, very urgent situation. And this lady who was there had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She intercepted him. Over in Mark, chapter 5 tells a parallel of this, and I want you to capture this. It provides a little more detail about her situation. And I think, really, I'm, I want you to capture this too, is, is when people know your situation, when you're transparent, when you tell your story, it does something to people. It moves people, okay, to know that. It gains interest in people. So we've got to learn to tell our story. It says that there was a woman who had, who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. She's bleeding in a womanly way, okay? And who suffered much under many, much under many. She suffered much under many physicians. 
This means it's a long-term issue. It's something that won't go away. And hers is, is womanly bleeding, but maybe you can relate to that. It's maybe not womanly bleeding with you, but it's something that keeps popping up in your life. Maybe it's a pattern. Maybe it's a habit. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a, a negative type of thinking that you have, right? And so hers is bleeding for 12 years, a long time, and she suffered much under many physicians. I mean, she was constantly at the doctor's office, constantly trying to get help for this, right? And she had spent all that she had. We don't know how much she had, but it was all. And I don't care if you're rich or poor, if you spend it all, there ain't much left, right? And so she, what this is telling us is that she tried everything she knew to do. She spent a lifetime trying to fix her problem, trying to get help for her issue, okay? And it says that as much as she had tried and spent and went to appointments and got in front of the supposedly the right people, right? The Bible says that, and it was no better, but rather grew worse. So this thing just won't go away. And I'm sure along with being uh, broke and miserable and discouraged, she's depressed, no doubt. And she, but, verse 27, I love this. She had heard the reports about Jesus. So, in the worst scenario that she was in, listen, is when maybe she's more in tune. Sometimes we get that way when we get desperate. We, we listen a little harder for God. And this makes it that important for us when we talk about Jesus, when we talk about, man, this is what's going on Jesus is doing in my church. This is what he's doing in my life. I'd love for you to be a part of this. Listen, some people might stiff arm it and tune it out and not take it seriously, but somebody that you don't even know about that wears a good mask, listen, they're hearing that report about Jesus. So that's what her, drew her near, her desperate situation. And combined with, I'm hearing people talk about Jesus, I'm hearing reports about Jesus. So that's in Mark chapter 5, a little bit of detail that's, that's not included in Luke, but it gives us a, a better picture of what's going on, the lengths that she's gone to to satisfy her own. You know what I'm saying? Don't raise your hands, people. Uh, I say guys, but it's getting to be a girl issue too. Listen, pornography. Maybe you've beat that before. Maybe that's something that, that you just stopped with in all your might, and then one day, poof, it just pops up again. All right? Don't raise your hand. You don't have to do that. But listen, maybe it's not that. Maybe it's something else that just you thought you had it beat, but it keeps popping back up. Right? And this is what's going on with her. So let's jump back in Luke chapter 8, verse 44. Are you with me? Say amen. Good, good, good. Luke chapter 8, 44. She came up behind him, talking about Jesus, and touched the edge of his cloak. There's something she must have thought that if I can just get close enough, I can get in his presence and touch him, maybe he'll touch me back. Maybe something will happen. And it says immediately, listen, it was that moment. That's what this series is about, is that moment when she decided, I'm going to get in his presence. I'm going to get as close as I can to Jesus. The Bible says immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? It goes on to say, who touched me, Jesus says. And I don't think Jesus, like I always say, he's not fun to play hide and go seek with. He, you're over there. You're over there. You're under there. He knows everything. But he knows there's a difference between somebody that wants to be touched, right, and healed, versus somebody that just wants to be touched. There's a difference, just like it is different while people come to church. Some people come, it's a place to go. It's a place to be. It's just cool. It's just fun. It's, it's boring at home. You know, somebody begged me to come. I just showed up. But there's a difference between that and somebody that comes in with expectation and desperation, and Jesus knows the difference, right? And so, he goes on to say, Who touched me, Jesus asked, and when they all denied it, oh, we didn't touch you. What are you talking about? Peter said, Master, people are crowding around and pressing against you. He's kind of getting smart, like, Hey, you're about to get crushed to death. Of course somebody's touching you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know, I know that power has gone out from me. I know that there's a difference. It's not the regular touch. This is somebody that needs a touch. And so it says, Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, there's no getting out of this, Jesus figured it out. She came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, listen, in, all, in, in the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him. She told her whole story and how she had been instantly healed. So she told her story. And, and that she had now been, I got in front of you, Jesus, I got near you, and I'm, and I'm healed. Then he said to her, daughter, daughter, your faith 
has healed you. Go in peace. He's saying, go, go in peace. Go being whole again. Go with a new life, a new comfort is what he says. So it's an amazing story. We could probably stop right there. It's so impactful. We could say a prayer, get Brad up here in the gang and go home. But there's so many awesome things that I just want to pull out of this, just a few of them this morning. So if you're, if you're taking notes, be sure and get some of these down because it's going to help you later. It's going to help you in moments that you need. It's going to help other people as you cross their path, and it's going to click in your mind that I can point to them in the Scripture. I can pull out a few points from this. It's going to help me bring hope to somebody's situation, right? And so I want to read this one more time, verse 43, one more time. But this time I want to read from the King James Version. This is what it says, King James. Instead of having this flow problem, this is how it, 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 it's worded. And a woman having an issue of blood for 12 years, which has spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed by anyone. I want you to pay attention to that word. A woman, woman having an issue. An issue. She had an issue of blood. I love this language because... It kind of puts it in perspective. Sometimes King James is hard to understand if you're not used to reading Scripture. It's something you may want to graduate to one day, maybe. But I love that word. I like to go back and see what other, other versions say. All right? But this is issue, and I love that because i got to be honest. I don't mind hearing about people's issue, and neither do you. Right? There's something about That's why gossip is so prevalent. Because right? when we know that somebody else has got issues, it makes us feel a little bit more normal, doesn't it? So we spend a lot of time and money doing that. And some of y'all flip through Jerry Springer in the mornings. You got the day off, you're sick, and you think medicine is watching Jerry Springer. Like, I feel better now. Look at all these losers, <laughs> right? Instead of flipping through, we flip, oh, we'll go back. And we're watching midgets and all kind of stuff. Like, man, I'm, I've, got, I've got it pretty good. And so it makes us feel kind of normal to feel like we've kind of got all our stuff together, right? And so I like hearing this. It makes us feel like we're not all alone. And so I want to tell you something that I've had a pretty creative week this week, and a lot of things that happened, just, I, I'm just there. I've seen uh, two wrecks happen right in front of me. I, you know, it, well, they weren't bad, so I can talk about them. And I was at Food Line. I like to go to Food Line because I used to work at Food Line. You know what I'm saying? You just go back to, you, to your roots. So when I was 16, I, and I'll tell you one day why I wound up working at Food Line. It wasn't a good story. Uh, well, I'll go ahead and tell you. I got caught stealing, and from my school, Hunter Hus, go Huskies. And uh, I got a big, long story, and that's why I want to go out in public. Well, I'll tell you this, too. Uh, I saw somebody, this girl I went to school with, and it was Tanisha Jackson, and she's sitting. Y'all might know her. Maybe some of y'all are kin to her. She saw me and just started a horse laughing, tilted her head back laughing, losing feeling in her knees laughing. <laughs> you a pastor? You ain't a pastor. And so we had that little moment of... Uh, you know, she reminded me that I've had that moment before, not in a good way. I've made some bad decisions. But I like to go to Food Line, and it was this one on Garrison. And so I went in there. And I'm telling you right now, I watched a woman steal. Okay, I see people steal all the time. All right. But she stole a tabloid. I don't know which one it was, a National Enquirer. Not that I know the name. But she folded it up. No, first she looked me in the eye. Then put it in. Not put it in, then look me in the eye. Look me in the eye, put it in, checked out with the rest of her things, and she, oh, she was on her way. And I thought, oh, did I just see this? I didn't tell because I'm not a tattletale and it wasn't worth it. But she must have really found value at looking at some really losery stories, right? I'm like, what? So I saw somebody else steal at QT over here along. I like to stop in there for gas some mornings when I go to work. And... <laughs> My uncle was with me. That's what it was. We were going to some appointment or something. And I said, that guy just put a, a, one of the big waters into his trunk. I thought, and we're, I'm wait, we're waiting on the, uh, the gas pump in front of us. I said, I think that dude just stole that water over there. He said, and my uncle can't hear. He said, yeah. <laughs> he didn't, man. But I thought, well, the gas pump opened up. But I was going to sit here just in the middle. I thought, are you serious? And so, and there was a few of them in the car. And the dude did just like this one more time. He said, he looked back at QT and picked up and got another one. And so people were stealing, yo. And so I thought, I might get me a water. Take it. That's what these are from, yeah. That's where these are from. <laughs> Cheers. 
But that woman must have loved. She just wanted to know something, that ugly stuff of life, right? And so uh, I love it that the Scripture talks about issues. It, it, it just throws it out there. It says you got issues. So while you're at it, just to make sure you're connected and engaged, I never want to hear somebody say, I just don't feel connected. Well, here's your chance. Look to the person beside you that you know the least out of the two and say, you have issues. Would you do that? All right. Now turn to the person, look, that you know very well and say, you got issues. All right. Listen, every one of us, whoa now, we got a lot of issues. All of us have issues. And listen, I think we just got to get that out front. When we, when we say we're Revolution Church, listen, if somebody's asking how awesome we are, tell them we aren't. Right? We have issues. I love that. We should have a shirt. There's another shirt idea, Sally. We have issues. Revolution Church, we have issues. Let's just do it. Because when we read Scripture, man, Scripture's so unique. It's not like life where you, you live life hiding your issues. Look at this cool shirt I got. Look at this awesome shirt. And it is new. I found it in my closet. I had a tags on it. I probably got it a year ago. I had at least seven people say, my shirt. I think they're making fun of me. Low key. But, you know, we spend a lot of time covering up our issues, you know, making sure that they're not visible. When Scripture's exactly the opposite, we've got to get that as Christ followers, as people. As you start to walk with Jesus, as you start to, to have a relationship with Him, one of the things is, listen, he, he, he loves you despite of your issues, right? Despite your issues, He loves you. So we're just going to put it out there because every time we read Scripture, man, some of the most glaring characters had the most glaring flaws. They just did. The ones we read about the most seem to have the, 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 the most issues, right? So we've got to get that in our mind and, and at the same time realize that none of our issues are too big or too bad or too intimidating to Jesus, right? So that's where we're kind of going here. Um, when I read about all these issues, I start really putting it out there like, why do I hide so much? Well, my story can tell a story about Jesus. Why would I withhold that? If grace really happened in your life, that should be a story we want to tell over and over. You got those people in life? Yeah. I just want to tell you the same stories over and over. You need to be that guy. So my, I got to tell you about this. I just have to, right? And so, but not just that we're a church or the Bible's full of all these losers and people with issues, but that God's grace is bigger than those issues. It's stronger than the issues that we have. That's the story of Scripture, right? That, that no matter how far from God people are, that, that God is, is within reach every single time. So Jesus always had people around him with issues. He got in trouble for it. He got killed for it. All the religious people that seemed to have it together that did uh, put on their, their best front. Listen, those are the people that conspired to kill Jesus. They didn't like him for this. They would even go to his disciples and say, listen, why is your master eating with sinners. Does he not know who he's eating with? Right? Why does he do that? And so, as a matter of fact, Jesus had a lot to say about people who did try to hack like they had it all together. You should have been here last week. If you weren't, you need to go back and watch it. We talked a lot about the Pharisees, and then he, he wore them out. He absolutely wore them out for being someone that they're not. He called them a hypocrite. And we throw that word around pretty lightly, but it, it, it had a lot of uh, meaning behind it. It meant that you're an actor, but you're dead on the inside. You act like you got it together, but you're dead on the inside. So listen, write this down. It might be something that you want to jot down or remember this week, over the next few weeks. Jesus always attracted people with issues. Okay? So as we read Luke, and this is what I was going to tell you earlier, Luke did this thing. He's a good writer. He was a physician. So he would pay attention to detail. Okay? Just like your doctor would. He's looking at things that regular people don't look at because he's a physician. They know what certain things mean and, and, and how to understand and explain them. And so Luke said it again. And what he loved to do, and I love this, it's all through the New Testament. You'll see a compare and a contrast. Compare and contrast. He's not just going to say, here's a story about a woman that's bleeding. He's like, here's two stories in one. Right? We'll get two for one. And I'm going to tell you about this guy named Jairus, but I'm almost going to tell you about this lady who had this uh, bleeding going on for 12 years. And so what it did was, it, it was on purpose so they could highlight two different things that's going on. So we could learn it and learn it. And I want to give you just a, 
just go into it just a little bit about these two different people. And I'm going to tell you this. There's three main points I want to share with you. I think it'll encourage you. I think it'll kind of move you along in your walk. And I want it, I want it to really point it at why Jesus uh, accepts us with our issues and also how we can get to that, that moment where it can change for the better, right? And so here we go. The very first thing I want you to learn from this, this whole story we're going to read is when it comes to God, not the people around you, but when it comes to God, your rep reputation doesn't matter. When it comes to God, your reputation doesn't matter. And I know what this means is your reputation doesn't mean anything to God. And I know I hear people in crowds, I've been in crowds, see that guy over there, he's got a lot of money, right? That's the mayor. That's the CEO. That's the boss man. Right? They have a reputation, and we, we get caught up in that a lot of times. People's reputation precedes them. For some people, that's good. Right? It paves the way. It opens doors for them. But for some people, it doesn't. It's like, man, let me tell you a little bit of something about them. I got some dirt on them. And so this might be a little bit of bad news for some of you because you got a really good reputation. You are hoping that your reputation, what you, what you do in life and what you do on earth somehow impresses God. That your bank account is big enough to where it somehow impresses God. But God, listen, lines his streets with gold, the Bible says. I don't think you can impress him. Does that make sense? So scripture's being real clear here. It's saying, look, there's no sense in trying to impress God. Your reputation, good or bad, doesn't faze him. You can bring in the worst thing. I got the worst story in this whole place. God's not shaking and Jesus isn't having second thoughts. He's not taking a double take at your situation. Right? Like, whoa, I hadn't seen that before. Right? As a matter of fact, I found a couple of scriptures that shows that God's no respecter of persons. What that means is, is, is that God doesn't show favoritism. Look at Acts chapter 10, verse 34. I'm not going to throw it up, but there's the verse and Romans 2, 11. It says that God does not show favoritism. He doesn't show partiality. It's nothing, that's not a tool that he uses to decide who he's going to have that moment with. That's not the deciding factor on either end of the spectrum. Scripture's really clear about that. Look, if you're worrying about impressing God or scaring God off or making him think about, hey, man, you probably shouldn't die on the cross for me because it wasn't going to be worth it because my situation's so bad. This Scripture's saying there is no partiality. There is no, there is no favoritism. But here's the good news for the rest of us. When they aren't saying good things, and not in a positive way, is that, listen, it doesn't matter. Some of you have been through some stuff. Stuff's happened to you that you had no control over, and you feel damaged, and you feel limited on what God can do with you and through you. Some of you willfully, like me, hey, man, I just did it. I did it to gain popularity, I gained acceptance, and I screwed it up. And that reputation, there's still people that know me to this day. They don't know this. They don't know, hey, we got a church, and it's going great. All they remember is, man, remember we broke into the school? And a lot of other things worse than that. That's what they remember me by. So I'm one, whew, I'm glad that doesn't matter to God. Number one, I ain't got to worry about being rich, impressing God. And, you know, I'm not the, you know, mayor. But also, man, I can be bad off and listen. It's not scared him off. So, if some of us was, were, were honest, we've got a messed up reputation. Like this woman's guy, she's known for what's going on with her. Um, but the Bible says this about Jesus in, in Philippians 2, uh, verse 6. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It just says that Christ made no reputation for himself. What that means is, you go back and read that, what that means is, look, Jesus said, I'm not coming to really make a name for me. I came so that lost people could be found to give my Father in heaven glory. So if he's not chasing reputation, we shouldn't certainly be worried about it. He's reassuring us in that moment. I, think, I happen to think we attract broken people. I don't know if it's physically, emotionally, spiritually. We, I love that about our church. That's what makes us unique. And they need to hear this message. They need to hear it and see it when they come in the door here, that I'm in the right place, that they can hear it clearly through our lives that it really doesn't matter about the reputation. So when somebody does stumble in here after a long, hard night, maybe even by accident, that they know they went up in the right place. Is that okay with this church? Okay. So in this, in this story, you've got two people. You've got Jairus. You've got this woman with the issue and two people that are really 
really different. And I'm going to look at their reputations here. Jairus has a name. Jairus is a cool name. It literally means enlightened one. It means light. His name literally means light. What that means is when he walks into a room, there's a difference when people walk into a room. When he walks into a room, there's like this glow around him. There's like, whoa. I mean, he kind of blocks everybody else out. He's an important guy, and it was just a glow. And I don't know if his... If he was named that originally or he changed his name to it, maybe his mama thought he was special. We got any mama's boys in here? I'm one. Mama's boy, your mama thought you were special, right? I don't know what's going on with him, but his name even means special. I'm a, I'm a pretty big deal. And so he's got this reputation. He's a religious leader. He's over the synagogue. He's got influence and impact. He's bright. He's sharp. He's educated. He's all these things. He's a religious leader. And he comes walking up to Jesus. He said, Jesus, not just walking, falling on his feet. I got a big deal happening. And he says, look, his posture says, listen, that's how you get that moment from Jesus. I think it's in your posture. Maybe it's not always on your knees and falling your feet to Jesus, but it's your, that posture in your heart and in your mind. He comes to Jesus, and he says, something's going on. My daughter's sick. I need you. He says, and Jesus said, let's go. But this woman, why Jesus on this, man, this man's name who is light on the way to his house, this woman interjects here. And I'm going to tell you what her name means. Let me find it. Well, shoot. The thing is, she doesn't have a name. Was that slick? Was that corny? I thought it was good. She doesn't have a name. So we see Luke doing this thing where, this is Jairus, he's a big deal, and then there's this lady. She didn't even have a, a name that we know of. She's not even... She's just somebody that's probably looked over. We don't know who she is. We don't know her identity. We don't know her destiny. We don't know anything about her. But that's the good news of the gospel. Listen, is that Jesus notices. So what we're going to find out here in just a second is she gets her miracle first. Isn't that awesome? This no-named lady, pay attention to that. She gets her miracle first before the important guy. Now, he's going to save his daughter. Don't get all worried about it. But this lady, as insignificant as she seemed and probably was, she's going to get her miracle first because she came in that same type of posture. You know, you want that moment or that moment when things change, you want it to be, I can't go through another 12 years of what I'm going through. We see what happens is, is that, that posture. And I love to read about people that are on the margin, on the outside looking in. It just doesn't seem to fit. And this happens all throughout Luke, and Jesus always responds to them. So... Your reputation doesn't matter to God. That has no bearing. and That should be freeing to most of you in this room. I know some of you pretty well. And I know most people are like, man, I just don't feel like I'm worth it or what God can do in me. I'm just, I seem like damaged goods. My reputation's not there. And so if we walked away with that message, our reputation doesn't matter to God, we should be praising Him for that. Now, here's the second thing. Not only does your reputation not matter to God, listen to this, your issue, I mean, uh, yeah, your issue doesn't matter to God. Did I say that right? Yeah. Your issue doesn't matter. Your issue doesn't matter to God. What you've got going on, that thing that keeps you distant, that thing that get, makes you feel disconnected from God, your issue doesn't matter to God. So we don't want to know this woman's name. But we know her issue, don't we? We know what's going on with her. People in the community know. They don't know her name. It's whole, uh, you know, what's her name? What's her, you know, the lady with the bleeding thing going on, right? You know her. Now, like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know who you're talking about, right? And aren't we pretty good at that as a, as a culture? We know people. We define them by what their issue is. But, but what we're trying to figure out here is that your issue doesn't matter to God. It doesn't ma matter what that is, right? Yeah. We tend to define people by their problem. And the Bible gives us some clues about her issue. It says that she bled continuously. And what a lot of scholars think is she may have had an STD. And you'll hear everybody say something. Well, I'm saying, man, she probably had an STD, which tells you that she was probably promiscuous, which tells you she probably was, lived a lifestyle of a prostitute, right? We don't know how desperate, we don't know her story. We don't know how desperate she had to be to, to have to resort to that. But it, the story is a sad story. It's a sad account. And her reputation, she would have had a reputation. So we don't know what was going on, but we know that, that she's defined by her issue. That's her name. Her issue is her name. So 
there's three ways that I want you to capture before we leave. Three things I want you to jot down the way the enemy wants to use your issue against you. I believe there's three ways at least, three really good ones. It's a pretty good tactic, right? I don't even try to high-five Satan, but it's pretty slick. This is what he does. Number one, the enemy uses your issue to separate you from God. He uses that. What you've got going on, what, what, anything I've mentioned before, your messed up relationship, it's pornography, your financial situation, right? Your reputation. He uses that to try to get you thinking enough to keep you separated from God. In the book of Leviticus, it's a hard book to read. It talks about all these religious rules back then in the Old Testament. And it said that literally people that, women that have womenly uh, flow every month, hey, that's a time that you weren't allowed in the church, in the synagogue. People had to stay away from you during that time, right? And so she didn't just have it once a month. She had it all the time for 12 years, right? So she wasn't allowed to go worship. She, she was made to feel like she couldn't get into the presence of God. Remember, hers is blood flow, but some people feel this way about their situation, their issue. I don't know if I'm allowed. I don't know if people would want me there. I feel like they would even maybe say something to me, right? And, they, and that's the enemy whispering. He's got a loud voice. It doesn't seem like a whisper sometimes, does it? Getting your head to tell you that, look, you can't go there. You can't worship. You've got this addiction. You've got this problem. It makes you feel like you can't have an encounter with God, so you're kind of stuck, stuck in your circumstances, right? He wants you to have that voice uh, in your ear. But here's what we know about Jesus. He was always hanging around messed up people. The more messed up, the better, right? He made it a point that every single time there's people on the fringe mad at Jesus for hanging out with people with issues. But listen, this is a, a, a whisper, I think, of the enemy. Hey, when you get things straightened out, when enough time passes, then try church, then go. Then go see what God has for you, right? Wait till you get things in order. Get your ducks in a row, right? Renew your reputation. And that's backwards from the gospel. The gospel says come now. Jesus come in your situation now. Listen, because if it was the other way, you wouldn't need Jesus, right? And so that's, what, that's the enemy's voice. Telling you, you've got to be able to recognize his voice. Don't obey it, but recognize it and replace it with the truth. I said, man, but I know what Satan's telling me. I screwed up. I even screwed up last night. That's Satan whispering in your ear. But that's why it's important to read Scripture to know what God says. That's his, that's his loud voice in your ear. I know I feel that and hear that from the enemy, but when I read God's Word and it's the truth, he tells me he loves me right now. Doesn't mean that people will. Does that make sense? A lot of times we think that somehow it's, our sin is transferred to other people. Sometimes there's a ripple effect to other people, right? It does impact other people when we sin. But listen, it's not supposed to keep you. It's not transferable in a way that you can't come to church. This has to be a place for hurting people. That when we start acting like we got all together, we might as well shut the doors and say, hey, why? We're not moving to that facility, $16 million. We're going to stay right here and just be tiny, Right? So we uninvite people when we don't let them know that they have access to Jesus. All right? So the enemy wants to use your issues to isolate you. He wants to make sure that you're off by yourself. And in uh, 1 Peter 5.8, it says this. Because, listen, the enemy wants to, to drive a wedge between you and, God, and God's people. He loves to do that. It's his favorite thing to do is to keep you isolated from that. And 1 Peter 5, 8 says this. It says that be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to, de to, to devour. And listen, a lot of times our response when our enemy tries to isolate us is, you know, I'm, I'm going to pull back a little bit. I'm not going to do quite as much as I was doing. I'm going to kind of take it easy for I'm going to disconnect from my friends. I'm going to kind of, you know, not go to churches off. I'm not going to plug in like I was. Listen, that's a strategy. We just read it. It says the enemy's like a lion. And I don't know what y'all's education is. Mine's really high. I got a lot of education, right? 
I'm very educated. And it's from Netflix. I have a Netflix education. That's why I'm so smart. For like $7.95 a month, I can watch documentaries, and I am so smart. I'm a genius. So if you, if you, all right. Anybody addicted to Netflix in here? Raise it up. Hey, amen, brother. Amen, sister. We all hurting, right? So I watch documentaries. I've mentioned this before where I like the animal ones, you know? And here's what the enemy likes to do. He knows. And Jesus is trying to tell us through Netflix documentaries or National Geographic that, look, there's a herd of people. There's safety in herds. There's safety when, when there's herds of animals. And the lions usually try to wait for the one that gets the most isolated so they can attack them. And that's a, there's a spiritual lesson to be learned. I told you Netflix, it's way better than uh, 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 big universities. I learned a lot in them. I'm not going to get by myself. I'm going to make sure I'm surrounded by people. I'm never going to let myself get isolated because that's when the enemy attacks. And he's not just coming and laughing at you. He's coming to attack you. Scripture says to devour you. Listen, because when you're in the herds, there's horns and hooves that that they kind of pitch in and attack and keep you safe in that moment. Some of you need to discover that or rediscover that, right? Because he wants you to feel, Satan wants to feel, make sure you feel disconnected because of your issues. When, when Scripture said it should connect you to God, right? And we're, gonna, we're, we're committing to be the type of church where issues are welcome, okay? So that's how the predators work. Here's the third thing. The enemy uses your issues to separate you from your purpose. Listen, God designed you with a destiny, a specific role that he'd have you play in this short life that we have, right? He allows you to have jobs and families and, 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 and friends and along the way. It's awesome. But he created you with a destiny and a purpose. And listen, as long as the enemy can whisper in your ear, which sounds like yelling sometimes, it's just enough to keep you from what God created you for, right? And then... That's when we get desperate and we keep repeating things over time is because we're isolated from his purpose. And back then, I started really thinking about this woman, and it made her unable to have children. She was barren. And the thing about kids, this is why I had kids, right? Um, I'm just kidding, kids. Don't cry. But listen, when you, when you had kids, this is kind of a retirement policy. You didn't have 401K. You didn't have Social Security. Listen, you know who's taking care of you? Your kids. But guess what? If you didn't have kids right? You had a rough life. You probably had to beg, hey, how about be a prostitute? Things like that. You had to do what you had to do to get by. And a big part of her purpose was to raise children. Back in those days, there was a lot more weight than it is now about having children. It, a lot, back then, it determined some value or a lack of value if you couldn't have kids, right? And so it was her issue kept her from being able to be all that God wants them to be. And some of you, you've got so much potential. When you talk, it's like gold coming out of your mouth. I can see sometimes it's, it's right on the edge. You're this far away from it. But I know it's an issue that's, that's been unresolved that you haven't had that moment with Jesus. You haven't had that encounter about that issue so that you can step into that. And that issue's got you held hostage to God's purpose and destiny for you. Okay, so this... There's a lot of Robin here, but so your reputation doesn't matter to God, right? Your issues don't matter to God. But I'm going to tell you what does matter to God. Your approach matters to God. Your approach to Him does matter. And I want you to write this down. This is something you could uh, jot down or tweet or whatever you want to do with it. You can have it. How you come to God matters not where you came from, right? I'll say it one more time so you get it. How you come to God matters, how you come to Him. But where you come from doesn't. So if you came from the poor part of town, like me, right over here, right? Or you came from a, an abusive situation, right? You come from a background of a lot of, a lot of mistakes, right? It doesn't matter where you come from. It, it, What's determined what pleases God, what moves him into action, what, what creates that moment that would change our life forever, that we wouldn't be the same after that, would be, a, would be how we approach him. And I love this. It says, notice how she come, came to God. It says 
in verse 44, she came up behind him and touched the edge of the cloak. That means she had to crawl. It means she had to get low. And she got low physically, and maybe sometimes we need to get low physically. Sometimes we have to pray in our chair or up front or in the closet at our house, right? But how we submit ourselves to God, that we come saying, hey, I'm beat down, I'm broken, and I'm, I'm at your mercy. And this is what it, the, the picture that it, that it did. In the Old Testament, we see a lot about what men wore, especially religious men, people that were rabbis, would wear. Everything had meaning. And there were tassels on the bottom. We'll spend another time on that of, of how, what it represented, God's word and God's people and all these symbolic things. And she didn't know. This is what I love about lost people. This is what I love. This is what I love about Luke because he's not Jewish. He's on the outside looking in. He's a disciple. I mean, he's following Jesus, right? He's a follower of Christ. But he loves to write from people's angles on the outside looking in. And I love this about her because she doesn't know what the rules are. She doesn't know. She just knows if I can get in his presence. A lot of times, maybe you've been in those churches where they set up a lot of rules. This is how you got to do it. This is the step you have to take. These are the classes you've got to take. And then we put you in front of everybody, and then you do this, and then you do that, and then you'll probably be okay. We add these steps and these layers to, to being connected to God. And I love her because she doesn't know any better. All she knows is if I can get in his presence, I've heard reports. I've heard he's done it for other people that are broken and messed up. If he can do it for them, he'll do it for me. And I believe if I can, I can have that moment where I'll never be the same if I just get get in his presence. So this is significant how she came about. So she thought, man, if I reach out there and touch one of those tassels, touch the hem of his gar garment, but it was her faith, right? Some of you are like, man, she can't, she's not saved yet. She can't be healed yet because she hadn't jumped through the right hoops. But we see her posture. It's a posture of humility. And I think we don't have to come to God on our hands and knees necessarily, although it's probably a good idea but in our heart that we would do that. And so I want to I want to talk about this. The Bible says this in verse 47. Then the woman seeing that she could not go unnoticed, right? Came trembling and fell at his feet. She was afraid. She didn't know what was next. And maybe, listen, some of you are in that same boat, man. Listen, I hear that I've got a family member that's following Jesus so close. There's people I really admire and like, and they, they seem to be, they don't have, they're, they don't, they're not perfect, certainly. They're messed up, but they're following Jesus. They're experiencing comfort and joy and purpose and destiny in their life. And I don't, I don't necessarily have that. I don't know what the next step is. I'm afraid. I'm trembling like this lady. What is next? But she had, with her faith, as the Bible says it, she fell at his feet in the presence of all the people. What she said, well, I'm tired of being this way. I'm tired of living life this way. This is no way to live. And I don't care who's watching. I don't care who's around. I'm not going to let anything else, the opinions of other people, keep me from being in the presence of Jesus. Because I, I feel like he can change me. That I can experience that moment. And it's because of her faith, Jesus said, that she was healed. And after I read this, I want you to stand. It says, Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace.